Welcome to Current Affairs at Copenhagen Suborbitals. What's happening right now in the Amateur Rocket Project, with the goal of launching a human being into space and bringing him safely back to Earth? Hosted by Thomas Peterson and Jakob Larsen. Hello everyone and uh, welcome to uh, Copenhagen Suborbitals and, uh, and our rocket workshop. Uh, we have two topics for you today and uh, we're going to start out right ahead with uh, just the first one. And we picked out this one. So Thomas, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so this is the, uh, the engine section for next to two. So uh, at the very bottom of the engine section we'll have the uh, jet main flange. So that is not completed yet, it's uh, still being uh, assembled. But it will sit here at the bottom, it will just be bolted on. It's uh, a modular assembly, so we can simply just bolt it on. And then we of course have the, uh, the engine, our 5 kN engine. And this uh, is actually the spare engine for Nexo 2. It's actually the Nexo 1 flight engine, which uh, even though Nexo 1 landed uh, a bit hard, uh, the engine survived excellently. So this is the, the spare engine for Nexo 2. Um, and it sits here, it's bolted onto the lock stone which is then bolted onto the uh, the airframe itself. So the engine alignment is actually done by aligning the lock stone. And we did that uh, a couple of weeks ago. So what would happen if we didn't align this one properly? Well, so that, that would give you a, uh, a thrust vector that would be a couple of degrees wrong. And then the uh, jet vane assembly, uh, well, the jet vanes would have to work excessively to correct for that alignment error. So we have aligned it to within uh, one degree, we believe. So, uh, so it's pointing uh, at the length of the rocket. Mm. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, on top of the lock stone. Yeah. So, right now, assembled here, we have the locks feed line. So, we have a, a, a tube that goes here to the uh, main locks valve. It's connected to a gear up here, and then we'll have a DC motor up here that will actually open the the locks valve, and then the uh, the piping continues up here until uh, this tri climb fitting, and right on top here we will have the LOX tank of the rocket. Yeah, well, this is one way of doing it. I mean, in this case we have one, uh, we've opted for one single LOX valve. In some designs you have two. I mean, more, what's the difference? Well, so in, so in this design we have, uh, I mean, one valve for the LOX side and one valve for the fuel side, and that's because we open them at slightly different times. So I have seen designs where you have a, a single valve, that controls both propellants and, and open uh, simultaneously. But we actually open uh, one slightly before the other. Mm. And then the whole notion about the, uh, the pre-stage and the main stage. Most valves, they open and close fully, uh, so it's either or. And in our case, we, <clears throat> we adopted these, uh, these proportional valves so that, that, we can, uh, that we can simply use the same valve for both main stage and pre-stage. Yeah. So if you look inside the uh, the housing here, the the valve, then you'll see that it's uh, the opening in the in the ball is not a, a circular. It's it's a V. So we can open it slightly. We open it to 44 degrees initially for the pre-stage function, and that will build up a chamber pressure of about three and a half bar initially, and will maintain three and a half bar pressure for 500 milliseconds once the uh, engine controller detects that we have three and a half bar for 500 milliseconds, then it will ramp up to full open and 15 bar chamber pressure. So those 44 degrees, that's very special. Do you recall what happened when it was 42 and not 44? Yeah, so, so there's a quite fine limit. If, uh, if the opening angle is, is too low, then we, uh, we hear this loud boom. We have a, a close to flame out, actually, and uh, then the engine starts with a loud boom uh, and, uh, and a quite excessive uh, force right when it uh, really ignites up to, to uh, full thrust. Yeah, basically a hard start. Close to a hard start, yes. yes. We, I think we have seen uh, pressure spikes in, uh, in excess of uh, 15 bars on some of the first runs. But yeah, we managed to fix this. Now we don't have this issue anymore. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this is, this is a small part of a rocket, so it looks like something like a really big ghetto blast or a handbag. Uh, it's, it's the modular concept again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so the engine compart uh, the engine section is, is just one module. Then we have the jet vane assembly as another module on the back, and then of course the uh, the LOX tank comes next as uh, as another module. And uh, so the last thing we could uh, show here that is uh, this clamp. So this is the uh, the launch lock that will uh, attach to the launch rail on on our launch platform on Sputnik. 
and then so we have one this is the lower one that sits on the engine section then we have one a couple of meters above which sits on the uh, on the fuel tank and that's the uh, the top uh, guide hmm. to uh, to make sure that the rocket lifts off vertically because the uh, the jet vanes they actually don't start operating until uh, we are at 15 meters in altitude okay so clear the tower then start steering yes yeah, makes exactly. sense all right well so this is the uh, the engine section of course the fins and shell plates and a lot of other equipment is is, is needed but uh, in this case it just gives a really good insight into what the uh, what the engine section looks on on the inside a couple of weeks from now we won't be able to see anything for pipes valves boxes controllers wires all sorts of stuff yes so I mean of course there's a uh, quite a bit missing right now so we're work what we're working on is we're working on the uh, fuel line and the fuel valve which we situated over here then we have some sensors that will mount on the engine uh, the fuel pipe has to be uh, extended down here to the uh, to the fuel manifold at the bottom of the engine remember it's a uh, regeneratively cooled so the the fuel enters down here flows up here before it's injected into the engine um, so and then all the shell plates we're missing they are up for painting uh, this weekend so uh, a lot of stuff is going on and uh, this should be assembled in a couple of weeks mm. all right thanks a lot three two one All right, so this is the uh, second topic today. What, uh, what is this, Yao? <laughs> this is the brand new thing for this year. This is the so-called DPR section. Again, a uh, modular unit, uh, which is, again, one of these standard components we can put into the rocket more or less everywhere we choose. All the mating flanges are the same. So we just need an engine in one section and a tip in one other section, and then we can basically juggle all the components. This one is the DPR section. And in this, what it does for us this year is that it brings uh, a lot of extra helium along on the journey upwards. This is a 300 bar uh, lightweight pressure vessel, which is, uh, which is uh, 20 liters. So it, with 300 bars, it will, it will contain about 6,000 liters of, of helium. Now, the helium is something we use to pressurize our tanks. Um, we did that on an X-1, filled the tanks about 55%, and then we had this helium gas bubble mm -hmm. on top. That's what forces the propellants out of the tanks and into the engine. Unfortunately, um, once we start using the propellants, the pressure drops in these tanks. So from the very second we push the start button, the performance of the engine decreases mm -hmm. all the way up. So if we bring some extra helium, and this is where the DPR section comes in, then we can replenish all the helium that, uh, that expands in the tank as the propellants uh, uh, get into the engine and furthermore when we bring the helium in a secondary compartment we can fill the tanks more or less to the rim so we get a lot more from this so looking a little further into this thing um, of course the carbon fiber wrapped tank here on top it has an aluminum inner liner but it's still pretty lightweight but extremely sturdy and so when you say lightweight how much is this one I believe it's about 20 kilograms if it had been steel it would have been much much worse so we also need to get the helium out of this tank and into the rest of the rocket. Mm -hmm. And for this, we have this uh, lineup, of, lineup of, of parts here, some really nice uh, stainless steel machine parts. Mm -hmm. As this has to be approved to more than 300 bars, then we need to make these parts really, really sturdy, high quality. Yeah. So, so what are what, we looking at here? Yeah. Right, so uh, we have a, uh, a plug that fits into the, uh, the bottom of the tank. Okay. And then that one would go like here. Yes. Right. And then we have a uh, main on-off valve for the, uh, for the whole high-pressure section. So that is this one. Okay. It can operate up to 350 bars. As far as I recall, that one sits here. Yes. And so that will distribute helium down to this piece. Just so, take this one off. Yeah. So this one would go up here. It's a distribution manifold? Exactly. Why a distribution manifold? Because we have two tanks. Ah, fair so enough. we have to run the helium from uh, one single tank into both the fuel tank and into the LOX tank. So when we, get the when we open this one, we'll have a helium flow down through this one 
And then we will have, we have two of these pressure regulation valves, which will sit here. One for the fuel tank and one for the liquid oxygen tank. And so from these, we will have lines going down to the tanks below. And uh, through those, we can then regulate the actual pressure in the, uh, the propellant tanks. Mm. And they, they give us some special advantages because of the, uh, the, the individual control of these proportional valves. We have the opportunity to actually set different pressures on the fuel and the oxygen tank. Yes. But what exactly will that do for us on our flight? Right. So uh, the, uh, the engine is, uh, is regeneratively cooled, so you have a significantly higher pressure drop on the fuel side than you do on the liquid oxygen side. So that means that the fuel tank has to be at a slightly higher pressure, and we're talking about one or two bar, than the uh, LOX tank. Hmm. So that's why we need to, to run them at uh, different pressures. And also to, uh, to ensure that we maintain an OF ratio of, of 1.3 as we intend, then we can control the, uh, the pressure in the tanks. And actually, the uh, pressure reg regulation will not be programmed to, to aim for a constant pressure in the tank, but it will be aimed at giving a constant pressure drop across the injector in the engine. So, uh, and the pressure drop is, uh, so the, the pressure inside the injector minus the pressure inside the combustion chamber. Mm. So, and that's what we're keeping constant, to have the same fuel flow and the same liquid oxygen flow throughout the mission. And this was why we did all the water testing. Yes, so, so this is uh, why we are working a lot with the water test stand to test the pressure drop across, across the injector. But it's also why we have performed so many engine tests so that we know at exactly which operating pressures we get the, uh, I mean, at, at what pressure we get what fuel flow and what oxidizer flow. One senses the idea that this has been the plan all along. Yes, and it, it certainly has. So, but it has taken a, a bit of time to, uh, to evolve into, uh, into this. So next year one uh, didn't fly with this system because it was, uh, it, it's so, sort of one step up in, in uh, sort of advancement. And uh, so now on Nexu 2, we feel comfortable in uh, implementing this. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks very much for the insight. Yeah. For further information about Copenhagen Suborbitals and our mission, please go to our YouTube channel as well as our homepage, www.corpsart.com. As we're funded entirely by sponsors and donors, we need the support of our many fans to reach our goal of manned amateur spaceflight. You can support us by contributing through the support page. <laughs>